Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. Discover Thrawn's origins within the Chiss Ascendancy in the first title in an epic new Star Wars trilogy, beginning with Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy. Written by best-selling author Timothy Zahn and read by Mark Thompson, Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy is on sale now wherever audiobooks are sold. This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Ashley Eckstein, Ahsoka Tano from Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, show number 358. We are your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. I'm your host, Dan Z, drinking One Nation coffee out of my Star Wars Rival Run Weekend coffee mug from 2019. Excited to share another exciting conversation here at Coffee with Kenobi with each and every one of you. On today's show, we have two special guests that will be joining us to talk some Star Wars. First, we have ABC's Clayton Sandell, who's going to talk to me about one of his big passions in the world of Star Wars and film, special effects and what they do to enhance a story when done well. It's going to be something that I think you will really enjoy listening to. Also joining us is Jody Pratt. She is the Ruggable Licensing Design Manager who helped to create some of these amazing rugs featuring Star Wars iconic logos, spaceships, scenes from the films, and so much more. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. Joining me today for a cup of coffee is Mr. Clayton Sandell of ABC News and Anywhere you want to talk Star Wars, you know Clayton is your guy. Clayton, hey, man, welcome back to the show. Dan Z, what is up? Thanks for having me back, bud. You are welcome, man. I specifically wanted to have you on. Well, anytime I can talk Star Wars, I, of course, want to have you on. But this one in particular, I think, is something that is in your wheelhouse. When you and I first became friends, one thing I learned fairly quickly on is you have a real affinity for the making of these films, particularly the special effects. In fact, you showed yeah. me something cool that you made uh, for your son, I believe, involving Santa Claus, right? Did I? Um, oh, yeah. Was that the uh, was that the thing I did with the the police helicopter? Yes, guys. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was like that was like my own personal greatest achievement in uh, visual effects. So what a, what this was. So it was uh, a couple Christmases ago. Um, I had uh, a buddy of mine was flying for the Riverside Police Department uh, helicopter unit, which is my hometown. And we had just kind of become connected through mutual friends. And uh, uh, he was nice enough to take us up one time in the in the police helicopter to kind of fly over the city. And so anyway, as sort of a thank you, we, he was talking about wanting to do some kind of cool project for uh, their social media channels. And so we, um, he he sent me a bunch of raw footage that they had taken around the city with their infrared camera, just kind of looking at buildings. And I wrote him a little script and I, they recorded this dialogue in the helicopter back and forth, basically that they were getting like prowler calls, like sounds of people, like sounds of footsteps on the roof. And so, uh, so we mixed that, that dialogue together. And then the visual was I composited, footprints on the roof of several houses like you know santa claus's footprints on the roof and um did it in in a program called after effects it was able to sort of track everything and and it actually uh thanks to youtube how to videos i was able to pull this off uh not through my own uh talent or anything like that but but thanks to youtube i was able to, to hack together this kind of uh weird composite but it turned out really well and uh some of the local news stations picked it up and stuff like that so that that is uh yeah my, my, the greatest my personal greatest achievement in visual effects i like it well and then and that's cool because this is something that you know from early on as a kid you're a big disney fan like i am but you're always drawn to disneyland and imagineering and how they're able to take 
I mean, that that's a form of visual effects, too, I think I would say, and how they are able to create this fantasy world that we can feel like we're a part of. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, I think that was uh, probably at Disneyland. So I, I grew up maybe a half an hour down the, the highway from Disneyland. And, uh, you know, that was my first, you know, sort of exposure to, to visual effects right in front of you, things that looked real. Um, I, I was fascinated with, as a kid, with how they were pulling off setting fire to all of these buildings in Pirates of the Caribbean. It was like, how are they doing this? And then you kind of study it and you look and you say, oh, maybe that's how they have this like silvery mylar stuff and a fan and an orange light. And that's all it is. And uh, Or the Haunted so Mansion, stuff. right? That and great. the Haunted Mansion. Yeah. I mean, you know, Yale Gracie, who was uh, sort of this uh, magician, really, he, he was responsible for a lot of those visual effects that you see in in the haunted mansion the the pepper's ghost effect was not something he invented but it's something that he put to practical use on a scale that i don't think anybody had ever seen before which is that effect of the ghosts in the big ballroom where it, you know you're looking down and you can clearly see through them and you can't see any wires or or anything like that and it's basically a a very sophisticated high tech uh, low tech but sophisticated um, reflection that you're looking at essentially. And, uh, so yeah, Disneyland was sort of the first, uh, my first real exposure to, to all of that stuff. And uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean flames, I actually, uh, duplicated that for a Halloween setup that we did a few years ago. And in our house, I had, uh, you know, I, I went to like the fabric store and bought this lightweight silvery material, stuck a fan underneath it and a couple of orange lights. And I'm telling you, it looks like flames. It really does. And I had it going in like several different windows and a sheriff's deputy drove by and he rolls down his window and he goes, you know, we're going to get calls about this later. Right. It was like, that was, that was the greatest, uh, that was the greatest <laughs> endorsement of this really simple effect that is, that is so good. Uh, Cause it really did. It looks, you, you set it up and it looks like just roaring flames coming out of your window. It's great. That's tremendous. Okay. So the, see, again, this is why we're having Clayton on to talk about visual effects, visual effects. Now, obviously they've been visual effects in Hollywood for, for much, much longer than star Wars existed. I mean, King Kong sure. is what kind of comes to mind and the Ray Harryhausen stuff. And just oh, yeah. Lot- George Malise going back to, yes. yeah. Absolutely. But but when Star Wars came out, George Lucas, he wanted to tell a story. He's obviously a very visual person, but he had to do something where the special effects added to the story. Kind of talk about how Star Wars uses visual effects to tell the story. Well, yeah, I mean, this this was uh, really, really groundbreaking. And what was what was interesting about it is that in order he knew what he wanted to do. But up until that point, it just hadn't been done. The, the technical side of it was still was still lacking. But one of the things that I think was was brilliant about what he did was that he went and he found all of this World War II uh, archive footage of of planes diving and turning, and uh, you know was, was able to basically cut together what was essentially an early <clears throat> early animatic or early previs clip for the folks at ILM to look at and see and, and match. And so, uh, you know, I, I just thought that was a, a, a brilliant use of, of that technology. But, I mean, obviously, you know, he couldn't have told that story without, without the visual effects that they were kind of inventing on the fly. Um, there's just no way to, to pull off a, a story like that. But the way, you know, things like, you know, really, really in the weeds, things like motion blur and all of these things that really sell a lot of those effects were things that just hadn't been been pulled off to that extent before. And to that scale, too. And so he, yeah. he, he does something really exciting, which obviously it's almost par for the course now in Hollywood, but it really isn't. When one of the first times I had Freddie Prince Jr. on Coffee with Kenobi, he said for him at the end of a movie, if it's just all special effects and there's no dialogue then you've lost him. That was what, that's how he explained. And I feel like Star Wars is really good about the fact that they are able to maintain a delicate balance between the dialogue, fueling the drama, fueling the pathos, but using special effects to kind of bolster how you tell that story. 
Yeah, and it's similar to to what uh, George Lucas used to say about the sets. Like you could build these giant sets, and the the tendency is to want to uh, really showcase these sets and and shoot them in a way that just just shows them off. And that really wasn't the point. the The point was for these sets and these these settings to uh, to, to serve the story. And I think that that's also what the visual effects were supposed to be uh in in his era i think it's changed a little bit now but visual effects weren't just thrown in uh you know left and right i mean now now i feel like there are visual effects just for visual effects sake but the ones that ilm was creating for for star wars and subsequent films i think were definitely designed to um to, to serve the story first and then be spectacle on their own second um which I think they achieved both pretty well. I did too. Well, well, last weekend I was on, um, I was a part of Force Fest, which was a, was a virtual convention, and, and I did a panel on the literary language of Star Wars. And it came up, someone had asked me about visual effects. It reminded me of a quote from a, from a film professor that I was really fond of, and he explained to me this way, take a movie that you love that has a lot of special effects in it, now take those effects out and still tell the exact same story. Is it a story worth telling? Is it something that you would want to see? Or do they have to have the special effects to do that? And if they do, it's not a good movie. This is what the film professor said. And yeah. so so how do, you, how do you respond to that? You know, I think it's interesting. I think they call them special effects. And the when Star Wars came out, I, I think they were – I think that was an apt – term and once you get away from 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 that from from using them to tell a good story and you're just putting them in there you know as window dressing just because you can or just because you think they should or it's going to put people in seats to see amazing effects in a in a trailer like in a like a transformers movie or something like that um well once you get away from that and it's just spectacle uh, then they're no longer special. I mean, Dennis Muren, who, uh, of course, is a, a veteran of uh, early Star Wars and is still a, a creative uh, executive at uh, ILM to this day. Um, this was uh, this was a few years ago. I want to say it was, you know, 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. He said that, that we reached a certain point where special effects were no longer special. Uh, and that's that's a problem. I mean, that's that's that is uh Kind of a mess, and and I will tell you two examples. Let's take a Star Destroyer for for example. Yeah, when, when you look at Episode Four, New Hope, I would argue that you know that opening shot with the Star Destroyer flying over over your head, that iconic opening shot. To me, that kind of a shot is still far more effective than. And I like the movie, but in The Rise of Skywalker, when you saw, you know, hundreds and hundreds, you know, beyond the horizon, Star Destroyers rising up into the sky, to me, that was not very effective. It was almost like overkill. It's like you look at that and you go, all right, that's, that's, you know, that's, come on. Do, do you really need <laughs> settle down, everybody? As far, yes. yeah. as far as the eye could see? And to me, you know, you could have, you could have sold that with far fewer. Um, and it just, to me, that just seemed like an example of, you know, we're just going to, we're just going to cut and paste Star Destroyers until the screen is filled up. And to me, it just lost its effectiveness compared to some of the early shots of Star Destroyers. You know, those two Star Destroyers coming after the Falcon as they're escaping Tatooine or whatever it is. Um, you know, that, that kind of a shot served the story, whereas I felt, uh, a little bit in, in Rise of Skywalker, like they were just sort of gratuitous. Or think about when we for, when you saw Return of the Jedi for the first time, and there's that great sequence where there's all those Tie Fighters rushing at Lando Calrissian as they're, as they're heading into the second Death Star, and there's just like this yeah. overwhelming feeling, you know, where oh my gosh, look at all this stuff, and it's not, and it's, it wasn't gratuitous; it was to to effectively show you, you know, the stakes have been raised exponentially because this is the Emperor's big showdown here. But yeah, and then so I yeah. I, I like I like the the comparison there of it's no longer a special effect or what is a special effect? Is it about the spectacle or is it about how are you going to tell the story? And, and I, what I argued at this panel and it wasn't really an argument, it was more like a just rhetoric 
I said, well, look at Ian Desher's William Shakespeare's Star Wars books. I mean, they're New York Times bestsellers. There's no special mm-hmm. effects that we have in our brains what that is, but it's 100% dialogue and advance in the story through characters, and you know, there are different changes in scenery. But the most effective things are told through the character and using special effects as a tool, but not as the primary lens to focus things through. Yeah, and I, and I think that's um, you know another good example of, of that. Uh, I think when it's when it's it's story and and character, like I think I think Baby Yoda is a great example of that. I mean, yes. this is kind of a mix of, of visual effects and, and practical puppetry and all of that. But at the end of the day, they used it all to create this great character and you fall in love with the character and none of that other stuff matters. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think that if the, sometimes the, te- the technology, you know, it just, it just draws far more attention to itself than, than it needs to. And, and, when you do something simple like that to service a character and service a great story, far more effective, I think. And it was Werner Herzog didn't that said, you know, don't you have to use a puppet for this? You you've got that's to right, use yeah. It. yeah. You got to use the puppet, yeah. And uh, according to Deborah Chow, was like directing the baby on the set. You know, like yeah, it was. Uh, they 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 totally bought into it, even on the set, which is great. Well, as you're talking about the Mandalorian, I mean, it's hard not to think about on Disney Plus the behind the scenes, the the Mandalorian gallery, that very much peeled back the curtain on how they made this very groundbreaking series. Really cool that Star Wars is again on the cutting edge of telling a story through technology. But again, it's it's a part of the story. It's not the whole story itself. So about how far yeah. Star Wars has come from from A New Hope on Tunisia into this, this incredible, it's almost like they took video game technology and brought it to a whole other level. Yeah. Yeah, And and it's amazing to me that, that 40 plus years after ILM, you know, was, was doing groundbreaking work, they're still doing it. I mean, it's, this is a company that could have by now sat on its laurels and kind of enjoyed it. You know, it's, it's status as kind of the, uh, um, the old guard of, of the visual effects world. And, and, you know, here they are still uh, as cutting edge as ever coming up with uh, this stagecraft volume thing, which is just completely, I mean, now other shows, movies are looking at using this technology. Um, the Obi-Wan series is apparently going to use it. Um, so, you know, they, they keep pushing the, pushing the ball down the field, which is pretty cool after all this time. It's what you want. So you back in it was back in early 2018, I believe you had the Force of Sound and ABC News feature, which looked at the sound oh, yeah. design of the Last Jedi, and you have the Skywalker Sound team. You work with Matt Wood, Ryan Johnson, the whole gang, and it was it was. I mean, sound obviously is you. If you don't have good sound design and sound effects then your visual effects don't pop. They don't mean as much. What did you learn about visual <laughs> effects through the study of sound that you got to do? Yeah, you know, it's funny. The uh, the best quote, um, the, the best quote that I heard came from, I, I was I was at ILM. This was before we had, uh, this was before we'd actually shot uh, anything for the force of sound, but it happened to be at ILM uh, and... Uh, my friend Landis, uh, who is a, a visual effects artist there, uh, walked me down the hall and we walked into uh, John Knoll's office and we were talking to John Knoll for a couple minutes. And I was kind of explaining this uh, project and what we were trying to do and why we wanted to do it. And he said the greatest thing that, that he, you know, he could have said, which is he said, good sound design makes the visual effects better. Mm. Because it helps sell what's on the screen. I mean, you can see the ship fly by or the laser blast or the explosion or whatever it is. And it may look amazing. Uh, but he said it's that it's it's when you see those shots with the sound design layered in and the cues all in there and the foley, the, the sound, the foley sound effects, all of that stuff, even the music. But he said, you know, good, good sound design is critical to to helping make the visual effects work, which I thought was a very gracious thing of him to say because he's a visual effects guy, you know, his entire career, um, but had such high praise 
for the sound design uh, angle of it. And I just, I just thought that was, that was cool. And I think about that every time now that I see a shot and hear the things going along with it. It's like, what, I wonder what my impression of that would have been. It's almost like you could just mute the TV and get an idea for what these shots look like in an ILM screening room uh, before, before they get all that stuff mixed in. So. I agree. And, and to me, when you, you've got, it's so critical to have that delicate balance what what when I appreciate a special effect the most is when I'm watching something, and I don't think for a moment, oh, that's a shot, that's a special effect shot. Oh, I wonder how they did that. Right. I like that I'm just watching it, and I don't even think about the fact that it's a special effect because it's just so beautifully done. The best example I can think of that is the uh, when when they replayed when they showed Black Panther, Tonner Chadwick mm-hmm. Boseman on ABC. I showed it to Mason for the first time. And whenever there were certain shots, you know, that, I mean, clearly I know Wakanda doesn't exist, but he, for him, it's like there's Wakanda. And he would say to me, Daddy, look at that sunset. Look at those ships. Look at that place. What a cool place. And I thought, these effects are telling a story to him. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I was, you know, before we chatted tonight, I was actually going through, I think I took it back upstairs, but I had my ILM, but the very first ILM uh, book that I ever got. It's called The Art of Special Effects by Thomas Smith and uh, got it for my birthday or Christmas one year uh, in the mid 80s. And uh, what blew me away is is we, there was a section on matte paintings and talking about iconic shots and just kind of revolutionary shots. I guess people probably knew this, but you know, when you the, the final shot of Raiders of the Lost Ark, when they're pushing when the guy's pushing the crate in between the giant stacks of boxes that go on and on and on forever. 90% of that shot is a matte painting that is on screen for like 30 seconds. And I, you know, I couldn't tell, I didn't know that. I mean, you look at that shot. I didn't know that until just it, now. Honestly, I didn't know you, that. Yeah. You, you look at the painting and the painting is in the book and you look at it up close and it's, uh, and they actually talk about this with some of the early, ILM matte paintings that they were not necessarily photo real when you got up close to them. When you get up close to them, it's almost like they just sort of, you know, slashed paint on it and it, it kind of did rough shapes and outlines. And then when you move back from it is when sort of the detail seems to appear. So it's this amazing illusion. So when you look at that shot in a book from Raiders, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't actually look all that realistic, but you see it on the screen and 30 seconds is an eternity for a matte shot in a, in an early 80s film. And yet, I think it, it holds up to this day. I mean, you and I know. I mean, that's both of our favorite movie. I had no idea that was a matte shot. Indeed. I'm almost yeah. embarrassed. Not really. I think it's kind of fun. That's that's the magic, right? That, yeah, that's, that's the what magic, right? It, and isn't it yeah. fun to, to walk through the halls of Lucasfilm? Well, I could just stop the sentence there. But isn't it fun to walk through the halls of Lucasfilm and you see those matte paintings that they've got out on display? Like the I think there's one from Die Hard Two. There's one from E. T. Well, that, yeah, the the one from E. T. And I'm shocked that they actually have them on the halls in in the hallways. Now they don't have uh, a lot of the Star Wars ones. They keep those uh, yeah, in the vault. George has those hidden away yeah. in the vault. But there are a lot of cool ones there. A lot of Die Hard ones. A lot of. Uh, uh, the the ET one is cool. That the e, there's one from ET, which is the the classic shot of ET looking down into the valley uh, from the hillside there, and he's kind of in the foreground, and and that matte painting is there on the wall by the elevators um, at ILM, and there's an amazing amount of detail in it. There's even a if you walk up to it, you can see uh, the artist, and I think it was uh, I'm gonna forget his name. Craig Allen, maybe. Anyway, that matte painting, if you get up close to it, he painted a bit of trivia here. He yes. painted a drive-in theater and then painted the Star Wars logo on the drive-in theater screen. And it's still there to this mm-hmm. day. You can't see it in the movie. It's far too small, but it's there. Just the notion of it. Just the notion yeah. of it. It's totally cool. Yeah. And, and, it's like and the I, greatest, greatest Easter egg you never see. You that's know? right. That's right. Almost as good as those Easter eggs that, that Reese's has on Easter time. Those are really good, too. Yeah, there you go. There uh, you go. So you mentioned, of course, we've talked about puppetry. We've talked about 
special effects in the Mandalorian and digital effects. But to me, it's it's the practical effects, which are a big part of visual effects, that will really sell a story. Raiders is a great example because there's so many practical effects in that. There are a ton of practical effects, obviously, in the original trilogy. And J.J. Abrams did a really nice job, uh, and so did Ryan Johnson, of bringing those back into the sequel trilogy, too. And I don't know, maybe it's because that's when we grew up, Clayton. I'm not sure. But I feel like the, the practical effects with a combination of some digital stuff, that to me tells the story the most. And maybe it's because it brings out the most in the actors. I think that's true. And, and I think that um, it, it, Guillermo del Toro, for example, he's a guy who wants to build everything. Because I, I think he... Uh, you know, he, he has said that, that audiences assume these days that everything is done with computers. And there are things that you just, you know, the, the more you can build things that are physical, he just believes that the better the movie is. And I think that's true. I think that the actors being able to, to bounce off of something is, uh, is, certainly, is certainly part of it. Um, I, I think he used the example one time of uh, in, in the Blues Brothers, if you remember the big car crash oh, yes. scene where like cars are piling up. There's like this giant car pile up. And, you know, he said that, you know, that was, that was something that was practical and you totally believe it. And uh, the, the assumption today is that that would all be done with CG. And it just, you know, you would just wouldn't buy it because you would you would you can tell you can automatically tell when something is CG as good as it looks and as good as it sounds and as, as good as they cut it into the movie. You're always going to in the back of your mind know that that was something they just didn't do practically. And, uh, you know, things like that are uh, uh you know, you really can't, you just can't achieve the same feel with, no. with something that's, that's digital. I, one of the, uh, one of the guys, if, if anybody listening is interested in, in visual effects, one of the guys to follow is Todd Vaziri from ILM. He's got such a great feed where he, first of all, he's, he's the nicest guy, but he also has such a love for what he does and this, this crazy enthusiastic energy for what he does. And so he shares a lot of, what he does and he'll do occasionally these visual effects breakdowns where he'll take a shot and explain how, how it was done. And sometimes it's, it's his own stuff. Um, and I'll, but a lot of times it's, it's other movies that he just happens to be uh, a fan of. And I remember, do you remember the movie Hooper with Burt Reynolds? Oh yes. He played a stunt man and there was this like crazy sequence where uh, a giant smokestack comes falling down and the car that they're driving goes right into the smokestack before it comes crashing down. Yes. And as a kid, I always thought that was like the coolest shot ever. Like I just, that, that <laughs> the timing of that was just amazing and how, how they did it. Well, of course, from watching Todd's feed, I learned that that was actually a very uh, clever uh, sleight of hand. It was two shots that were, that were combined with a, with, with a very quick wipe. Uh, that made it appear that that shot was was shot in real time uh, on on the set like that. It was an effect, but uh, so you learn all these. But to me, there was no computer. It was just kind of a mix of two shots. It wasn't, right. wasn't CGI that that made it work. Um, but yeah, I think that the practical always will will always be more believable and will always sell it. You know, you can enhance it like they do with Baby Yoda. He's he's partially CGI. Uh, in some scenes, but uh, yeah, I think there's nothing beats the practical. I think the best marriage of practical and CGI is the original Jurassic Park. I mm. mean, remember how that absolutely took our breaths away, and yep. we believe we were watching real dinosaurs it's so much so that it was it was it was not easy to tell when we were looking at a a massive T Rex puppet and when it was CGI. To me, that is, I mean, of course, that's ILM, right? And then you throw in Steven Spielberg yeah. and you put a John Williams score or, or no score in the case of the T-Rex attack. That is something that shows you, look, you can tell a story this way. And it's not a gimmick. It's just an effective means of getting the audience to feel that suspense, feel that terror, feel that excitement that we want in the in the trip to the movies. That's right. Yeah. And, and that was, uh, those were great examples of what, you know, shot to shot to shot within just a few seconds, you were seeing practical digital back to practical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, 
uh, a really clever, clever mix and sleight of hand uh, using all using all those technologies. But at the end of the day, all of that stuff was serving the story. Absolutely. So, so real quick before we let you go, when the, the what you just described there, is it all fall on the visual effects creators, or is this up to the editors, or is it kind of yes to all of the above? Yeah, I think it's all of the above. I think it's I think it's the director, you know, has this vision and they have to uh, communicate it well um, and communicate the story well. And everybody has to be kind of clear on what the, the story is. One of the complaints you'll hear from uh, visual effects artists, you know, when people complain about bad CGI, it's probably not that the artists did bad CGI. It's probably that the shot design was bad or that the director didn't have a clear vision of how to tell a certain part of the story. And, you know, maybe something was added very late to sort of fill a gap and things like that. So uh, visual effects artists really bristle at that, um, that notion that there's bad CGI, that, that it's more bad shot design, bad communication of an idea, bad, you know, starting much earlier uh, uh, in the process. But yeah, it's a, it's a hugely collaborative thing. And, one of the things that I think Star Wars and Lucasfilm has has always done really well is from the days of, of you know, before George Lucas, he had even really sold that movie to 20th Century Fox. He had Ralph McQuarrie yeah. paint these, you know, five or six paintings or whatever it was that, that helped them visualize what this movie was going to be. So it, the, the point is the use of the art department – um, early on in Star Wars is what I think helps to kind of lock in some of those ideas. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, results in all these great art of books <laughs> that we get to enjoy. Yes. Uh, that uh, Phil and the gang put together. So, uh, so that uh, it, it is, it is a, a, a totally collaborative totally collaborative effort. I think every, everybody has sort of an equal, equal stake in it. And, um, you know, everybody wants it to succeed once what's each, each individual shot to succeed. So, um, yeah, I think it, it's, it's all around. It's the art department, it's the directors, it's the producers, everybody's kind of be on, gotta be on the, the same page, I think, to, to make it work. I love it. Well, Clayton, thank you so much for sharing your passion and your insights into the world of visual effects and storytelling. It was a blast having you on, dude. I don't know about insights, but I do love this stuff. It's really fun. I just I love all the behind the scenes stuff. And, uh, you know, like we've kind of talked about before, when Return of the Jedi left the theaters, uh, we thought Star Wars, I thought Star Wars was done. So that's kind of where I turned my attention was to kind of learning uh, a yeah. lot about how they how they did it. So that's that's a lot of a lot of fun. But uh yeah, how's uh, what 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 fun Star Wars thing has has been occupying you lately? What have you been Star Warsing lately? I mean, honestly, the top digital Star Wars digital card trading app is a blast because there's always amazing pictures and they've got a lot of concept art on there. There's a bunch of Macquarie stuff on there that I think yeah. is fun. Uh, I've cool. I've been enjoying uh, reading. I, I reread or not reread, but I I really poured over. J.W. Rensler's The Making of the Empire Strikes Back uh, for the first time. And I know I was texting with you quite a bit while I was reading that thing. And, and you would so say, good. it's it's one of the coolest things I've ever read. Mm -hmm. And it goes over yeah. all the stuff we yeah. were just talking about. Yeah, it's really great. They did a he, he did. A, he and the team really did a, a great job on that series of books. And what about you? What, what, what Star Wars-ness have you been? Are you, I'm assuming you're super excited about yeah. season two of The Mandalorian. Yeah, yeah, can't wait to uh, to see uh, that trailer. Hopefully, that's coming out fairly soon, um, which will get everybody spun up. We haven't had a lot of Star Wars lately, which no. uh, is kind of there's been a Star Wars drought. Um, but actually, so we've kind of been rewatching The Mandalorian a little bit. Um, we have I, I've you know, I've gotten into. I kind of slept on the Return of the Jedi soundtrack, and I've kind of been getting back into that lately. Really, that's a great soundtrack. It, it's so good. It's really good. And did you? I, I don't know. You may have known this. Uh, I did not know this. I, after listening to the soundtrack, I went back to uh, listen to David W. Collins talking about the soundtrack of the Return of the Jedi. Did you know that the Star Wars theme slash Luke's theme? 
the that theme and Luke and Leia's theme share like the first five or six notes. They're just arranged differently. No, I didn't know that. They're the they're the exact same notes. If you listen to it, it's just the timing is different and the arrangement is different. But the first, and and I believe it's the five, first five or six notes, maybe six. Um, but so I'm learning all sorts of new stuff about uh, the score that I never knew, which I'm getting tremendous pleasure out of. What brought um, that? What brought that soundtrack on your radar? Was it just David W. Collins? Who, by the way, is of course a master class in in explaining music. Yeah, yeah you know, um, I honestly. I, I think when I started listening to it, uh, this was a few, couple months ago, and then I, I kind of got into. I, I'm not, you know, you know, I'm not a big collector, but I do scour Facebook Marketplace from time to time for the old ships, the like the original trilogy ships that I never had, could afford, yes. never could afford as a kid, and now I'm going back and trying to collect some of them. So. One day, I know listeners can't see it, but behind me there is my my Tiderian shuttle that I found uh, from a guy uh, it, it, on Facebook. I was very jealous uh, when you sent me that. That was cool. And my B wing, and so I think I I think I sort of got a, a couple of um, Return of the Jedi ships, and I just started thinking about that movie, and uh, popped in the soundtrack one day, and, and there you go, and then just sort of started getting into it again. Well, I will say this summer we went and saw The Empire Strikes Back of the Drive-In. I know I told you about that. But it really struck me more than of all the times I've seen that movie. And, of course, it's our favorite Star Wars movie. But it really struck me how critical and crucial John Williams' score is to that movie. I don't think that movie's half as powerful without his soundtrack. I really don't. I, to- I totally agree. That's, uh, that's the last Star Wars movie. Well, I guess uh, I take that back. Rise of Skywalker, but my wife and I went to the uh, the Colorado Symphony, did their Empire Strikes Back play along, where you watch the movie and then they play the soundtrack live, which play the music live, which yeah. is if you ever get a chance to do that, is is second to none. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. But you're right. I mean, that really drives it home that that music was just um, absolutely groundbreaking, and and still is my favorite Star Wars soundtrack of all. Yeah. Same here, same here. On on we did uh, Facebook Live a couple weeks ago. We did top five favorite Star Wars soundtracks, and Empire is pretty high mm-hmm. for quite a few people. Yeah, quite, quite a few people. I love it. Very I love cool. it. Well, hey man, where uh, can people reach out to you if they want to ask you any questions and continue the conversation? Uh, sure. I'm uh, on on the Twitter. It's uh, at Clayton underscore Sandell, and I'm um, trying to be better on Instagram, which is Clayton Sandell. ABC. Uh, I love all the Star Wars celebration pics that you posted too. Oh man, are you just missing it? I mean, uh, you know, I, I was, getting... but I, but I, I was okay with it because I was I was okay with spending a little bit more time, saving a little more money to kind of live it up more. But what I really missed was Star Wars Night at Disneyland. I missed walking around the show oh, yeah. floor with you. Uh, just I the know. surprises that happen on a daily basis, and just that incredible camaraderie. But I feel like that's a great thing. Why you know, like you know, chatting with you here on the show or following your Twitter feed or just that there is a wonderful stars community out there that can kind of help fill that gap in the meantime. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. The, uh, the bummer was I kept getting, I kept getting alerts on my phone cause I'd set my calendar to remind me of certain things yeah. as we got closer and closer. Like we never, we never, I was going to cover it for work and we never book our hotels early. So I kept getting these reminders like a couple of weeks ago, make sure you've booked your hotel. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> and when I sit here at my desk, I, I still uh, I still have it. It's a constant reminder that I was also supposed to be at Star Wars. Yes. Uh, Star Wars night at Disneyland. So that's a bummer. But you're right. It's uh, I, people have kind of stepped up online a little bit and we've all kind of shared our stories and uh, good memories. So hopefully there will be a lot more when uh, when it rolls back around. Yeah, it'll just make 2020 that much better. But it's going to be interesting because now we don't have a Star Wars movie around 2022. I hope that doesn't affect Celebration. I don't, can't imagine well right. because they're going to do it every other year around D23 Expo. I'm thinking really strongly about going to D23 next year. So keep that in your radar. Yeah, I think so too. I think I think we're going to see. Um, I think we're going to see quite a few Star Wars related announcements that we would have seen this year. Yeah, then we'll finally get that at, Clayton Sandell at- solo film. 
Yeah, we can dream. dare to dream. You yes. got to give the people what they want, right? Exactly. Well, hey, thanks again for being on, dude. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. Sounds good. And now, let's see what's brewing in the Star Wars universe this week. Oh, wait, this is interesting. You found something. I'm about to let everyone in on the secret. Back by popular demand is our CWK newsman, Tom Gross. Tom, buddy, you uh, you set the internet ablaze last week. <laughs> well, it was good to be back. And so such kind words uh, from everyone. So thank you so much. It is wonderful to be back. And we have more news tonight. Let's do it. All right. StarWars.com announced this week that the debut of Season 2 of The Mandalorian will air on October 30th on Disney+. Plus. This means you have eight weeks to go back and rewatch Season 1, which, by the way, has been nominated for 15 Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Drama Series. Now, with Season 2, there is so much to look forward to, with, of course, The Mandalorian and the assets, Cara Dune, Moff Gideon, and the Black Mandalorian Saber, and... Well, Ahsoka, and who knows who else may show up in this season. Bum, bum, bum. So some yes. some fun things about this. I mean, one is it's literally just an image and we have a date. And I do love that on StarWars.com's and all the social media accounts that said this is the day to yes. indicate that we had I a day, that, yes. which is fun. When you said it was eight weeks, it made it seem a lot longer than what it felt when I read it this morning. But you're right. It is eight weeks. So here's what we know. Pretty much nothing. What I do like is that the picture now, and I'm sure everyone has seen the side-by-side comparisons, that, is that instead of the Mandalorian in the middle, front and center, we've got the Mandalorian looking down at the child and the child looking up at him, which is pretty special. And I like the fact that it's blue because that indicates more warmth as opposed to the kind of the, the brown terrestrial image from season one and that's all my pop culture literary professor hat can do with one image (laughs) right yeah i just you know i i kept saying i've been talking about it with uh my family and saying you know it's it's coming up this fall it's coming up this fall and it's just been nice to be able to, to be able to now say october 30th and boy am i glad they didn't do it on the 31st because Boy, I would to make that decision whether well, kids, you're on your own on Halloween this year. <laughs> Didn't want to have to make that call, but how great! I am so looking forward to this uh, ser- this uh, season. Um, just so much, so much was left out there that we that we want to know about. Um, so exciting stuff! It's very exciting, and and people keep asking me when are we going to get a trailer? I don't know. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> Whatever. Here's what. Here's what I think is pretty great, and what what happened today with the internet and social media. Unless you see it for sure, ninety nine percent of the articles and Twitter accounts and websites that say they know don't really mm-hmm. have any inside scoop. That's yeah. That's that's. Uh, and I certainly don't mean that as a uh, negative towards people trying to make a living. You know, go do what you got to do. But as you know, what the policy is here at Coffee with Kenobi, unless it's from Disney or Lucasfilm. We take a wait and see approach. That's right. I always know when you say you don't know, there's nothing to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. All right. Well, with the release of the first book of the highly anticipated Thrawn Ascendancy Chaos Rising, StarWars.com interviewed author, well, Timothy Zahn. The interview delves deeply into Zahn's take of the Chiss and Thrawn's culture. Zahn is asked about his approach to developing the intricacy of the Chiss Society, and Zahn reminds us that he has dropped hints here and there in other books, but in reference to the nine families of the Chiss, he reveals that they are somewhat like the Borgia family of Italy, where individuals are shifted and rematched to other families. But unlike the Borgia family, in the Chiss, individuals who are phased out of a family may actually come back in. So, the book, te- uh, the book takes us back to the origins of Thrawn, and when asked about what it was like delving into Thrawn at this time of his youth, Zahn says that Thrawn is pretty set in his mind in the way that – or I'm sorry, that Thrawn isn't pretty set in his mind, but Zahn is pretty set in how Thrawn thinks and deals with things. But when he is with his own people, Thrawn has different obstacles and goals. There's a lot of politics in the Chiss ascendancy, and Thrawn just isn't good at that. 
The interview goes back to discuss the Chiss and how they see alien species. It goes into Thrawn's interactions with Skywalker, space battles, and more. Check out the interview on StarWars.com, but don't stop there, my friends. Click on over to the Coffee with Kenobi website as well, where our very own social media specialist, Lisa Dillard, has a review of the book and the audio book as well. So don't miss out and see how Lisa rates the two. Yes, and we certainly won't talk about the book for a couple of months and give everybody plenty of time to read it. Lisa, of course, as always, does wonderful reviews that are spoiler-free. And all I'll say is that the book is fascinating. That's all I'm going to say. Cool. I love the look of it. You showed it off this uh, Monday night on uh, CWK Cafe. Yes. Um, the Facebook Live. And uh, the blue pages are stunning and cool. And I've seen lots of other people online who've uh, received their copies and are just so excited. I mean, what a, I mean, it's it's kind of gimmicky, but at the same time, it's it's there's meaning to it as well. It's so, delightful. Yes, I love it. Yeah. So I think that is so cool. And of course, yeah, I'm a book guy. So yes, uh, you know, anytime they anytime they do something like that in there, uh, a lot of fun. So um, I actually purchased this one based on um, um, on a review I read. I went ahead and purchased the audio book and I'm looking forward to diving into that very soon. Oh, great. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Well, I don't know if you missed it this weekend. Uh sir but uh if you missed the cargo ships coming and going from the local target store then you should know that target's trading post collection inspired by star wars galaxy's edge at disneyland resort in walt disney world resort has landed this new collection gives fans like me the chance to experience their very own galaxy's edge adventure check out a sample of the goods at the coffee with kenobi website and on StarWars.com. Now, I know, Dan, you went to check it out. What did you find this weekend? I Well, you mentioned Facebook Live, which, of course, we have every Monday night at 8 o'clock p.m. Correct. Central Standard Time. So I showed off a few goodies there. I got the um, – we got the Hondo Onaka 6-inch Black Series figure. That is courtesy of the wonderful Tyler Pompa, who is a member of the CWK Alliance, and picked that up for me and yeah. dropped it off at school, which is – so cool. So thank you again, Tyler. That was really, really awesome. I wouldn't have had it without you for sure. And I got a, a black and orange three and three quarter inch droid only because those are our school colors. So I thought that was great. I got the yeah. Sabak deck. It's not actually Sabak cards, but they're Sabak shaped and colored, but it still has the normal suits, you know, hard spades, diamonds, clubs. Oh. Very, okay. very slick. I might bring that to school just to show that to you. I got a 500-piece puzzle, which is the art from the Millennium Falcon from Batu, and I think that's about it for now. But I, I took a lot of pictures, put it on Instagram, and it's just great to kind of see new Star Wars stuff and having anything with that that tan Galaxy's Edge logo is really pretty pretty special. But I will say, and no one is talking about this, at least that I have seen, but the things that are at Galaxy's Edge outpost for at Target stores. None of that stuff, to my knowledge, is sold actually at Batu. This is just something to kind of give you a flavor or a taste. Okay. But it's different, different kind of quality, different kind of lots of things. Oh, cool. Neat. But not less, um, just different. Yeah, It's important, absolutely. And important to note I, that. I have to say that, um, and I don't know what our local store has versus other stores or what's online, but um, both of my girls have their eyeballs on those uh, blankets with the hoods. There's the Chewbacca and the R2-D2. Yeah, they had those, some there when I was there. Did they? Okay, so so they have their eyes on that. And I'm quite partial to that green uh, long sleeve uh, shirt with the falcon on it. They had that too. I just – I like the look of that. I think that looks really sharp, and I'm excited to see what other things are there. Um, it's just fun to have Star Wars back in the stores. Um, you know, it's been kind of sad to walk back to the toy section. And um, you know, the other day I was at I was at Target, and I said to my daughter, "So let's go look at the toys." And she goes, "Dad, I never really thought a dad would say, let 'Let's go look at the toys.'" <laughs> so, anyway, looking forward to uh, going and seeing that uh, probably this weekend. I love it. Well, hey, man, uh, do you have a quick story for us before we uh, we hit the show break? 
Yeah, let's let's get one more in there then. Uh, finally, in the absence of Star Wars Celebration, it seems that uh, many are creating exciting, unique virtual cons, like the Topps Digicon last weekend or the fan-based Force Fest. But now Hasbro has announced earlier this week the first ever Hasbro PulseCon, which will be a two-day event, September 25th and 26th. PulseCon will be hosted on the soon-to-be-launched Hasbro Pulse YouTube channel, and it will be hosted by Sci-Fi Wire's Jackie Jennings. The PulseCon, the PulseCon rather, will include product reveals, live unboxings, live stream panels featuring celebrities, and audience participation. And what caught my eye in this story is the exclusive three-pack action figure set that has the 501st Legion ARC Troopers, and that will be available while supplies last. And while, you know, while we're talking about these virtual cons, how was your experience hosting the panel at Force Fest last weekend? You know, it was a blast. We had uh, some of our loyal members that come to us every Monday night for Facebook Live. And then there were some new folks I got to chat with. I got to actually talk on screen to Jared Cantor, which was wonderful because Jared and Excellent. I, of course, have chatted, you know, for years. He's been on the show a couple of times, but we never got to talk via video or to see each other face to face. So that was a really nice surprise for me. And and the fact that we raised over $3,000 for the Make-A-Wish Greater Los Angeles area is absolutely wonderful. Oh, and that's what it – besides the community and conversation, that is what it's all about. So fun to see some of these uh, little virtual fests popping up um, all over the place to add some fun to our weekends. Um, but still looking forward to that uh, big old celebration in a couple of years. Oh, yes. it's It'll be here before you know it, but I tell you what. Thank, hey, thank you so much for bringing us the latest Star Wars news. Oh, of course. My pleasure. We will take a quick break. When we come back, Joni Pratt of Ruggable will talk about their amazing Star Wars collection. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books but can't find the time? Try listening to them on audio, featuring sound effects, top-notch narrators, and music directly from the movies. Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. Discover Thrawn's origins within the Chiss Ascendancy in the first title in an epic new Star Wars trilogy, beginning with Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy. Written by best-selling author Timothy Zahn and read by Mark Thompson, Thrawn Ascendancy is on sale now. And if you're looking for a full cast audio drama, don't forget to try Dr. Afra, read by an all-star cast, including Mark Thompson, Catherine Tabor, Jonathan Davis, and more. Dr. Afra is on sale now. Visit penguinrandomhouseaudio.com slash Star Wars to listen to clips and find your next listen, or buy now wherever audiobooks are sold. MEI and Mouse Fan Travel is your one-stop shop for your vacation needs and your plans to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, or the cruise lines. Travel looks much different now than it did a couple of months ago, and with the opening of Walt Disney World and soon, hopefully, the opening of Disneyland, you need a place to go where you can trust, and they will help you figure out and navigate all the different circumstances and guidelines that Disney has put out for you. And I can say that we had our vacation modified, and as soon as dates were announced, MEI contacted me directly to help me reschedule, which is exactly what I was hoping to do. So if you are interested in rescheduling your vacation or want to try to plan a Walt Disney World Disneyland vacation or anywhere else you want to go on the planet, be sure to contact MEI and Mouse Fan Travel at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel. Their signature service and expert advice will help you maximize your vacation time and dollar, and they will help you figure out all the different changes and modifications going on at the Disney theme parks. They are amazing, and I can tell you, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, the peace of mind that Becky Menken and the crew at MEI and Mouse Fan Travel have given me is invaluable. If you're interested at all, again, go to www. That coffee with Kenobi.com slash mouse fan travel. Joining me today for a cup of coffee is the Ruggable Licensing Design Manager, Jody Pratt. Jody, welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. Hello, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Yes, Joni, we are very, very excited to chat with you. We when I, we first found out about actually I first found out about Ruggable doing the Star Wars line through Facebook. It popped up on an ad and I thought, oh my goodness, 
what is this? This looks amazing. And then I heard from Disney shortly thereafter, and we yeah. were able to get in touch with you. And boy, am I glad that that happened. So, Joni, you have done something really, really special uh, with these rugs. They are gorgeous. We're going to talk all about them. But first, let's talk about Ruggable Star Wars line and how it all came about. Well, I would love to say it's my brainchild, but it actually happened before I got to the company. Um, my art director, Zane Kearney, they were talking about the Disney collection and how well it was doing. And we're like, I wonder if they'd let us do Star Wars, you know, what could we do? So they started putting a plan together um, to go to Disney and say, hey, we want to do Star Wars. We think that we can do something really cool and elegant that our consumer will want. And I, I would certainly say that has absolutely happened. So let's let's sort of talk about that. One of my favorite things about these is that you can have them in your home as a hardcore Star Wars fan or someone who just wants a beautiful rug to decorate their home. What was the lens you filtered each design through as far as balancing the design of the rug for different levels of Star Wars fandom? So that's the thing is, is we took a look at the typical home decor patterns and wallpaper and then thought about Star Wars and the icons and the iconography and how can you overlay that onto all these home decor patterns, you know, whether it's in rugs or wallpaper or fabric to elevate, you know, that, that look and to tell the story because the story is really important. Um, so we wanted to be able to be sure and also elevate everything but to tell a story. Um, yes. We kind of focused on the techniques of rug design to see where some of the components might fit. Um, and then, of course, you, you know, as you get a little further in, you start looking at the composition, you know, like our twall. It's like, is this really telling the whole story of the Empire Strikes Back? Did we get this scene? Did we make sure we have this? Do You know... Have you got all the classic characters and, you know, just the little nuances of the TIE fighters flying through in the background or the Tauntaun? You know, all those little details were really important to make it come alive. But then you take that and you overlay color and what our consumers want in their home and you take the different colors and it's how can I apply? Cause star Wars is pretty black and white. I mean, when you think about the colors of it, but there really is some other beautiful color to it, some depth. So how can we elevate our rugs and apply the depth of color in star Wars and create a really nice balance with everything? And it really is legitimately uncanny the way that you're able to make that happen. And honestly, my litmus test is always my wife. Because if, if you put Star Wars on, <laughs> on a piece of toast, I'm going to think I must have that toast, right? So, but, but I said, hey, Deanna, do you know about Ruggable? And her eyes popped out of her head. And she said, yes, I love their rugs. And I said, well, guess what? They've got Star Wars rugs. And right away, she wasn't even skeptical. She said, let me see them. So I open yeah. up the website. And we pour over them, and, and she's loving them. And as I said at the top of the show, you've got this amazing balance of things that are there for hardcore fans. And then they're also, some of them are so beautifully subtle in a way that you can just have a, a gorgeous rug in your home that's washable, and and you're, you're making everybody happy. So kind of talk about how you feel when you hear something like that. You know, it, it, it's super, it, it, it excites me because you're right. We, we did some rugs that are totally for the fan, but then you've got our really elevated damask. And if you are, you know, our dark side damask, and if you look at that, it's a beautiful damask that you could find in any living room, anywhere. It's got great contrast, great color, great texture. And then when you look closely, you're like, oh my God, wait, that's Darth Vader. 
wait, is that his helmet? Are you sure that's his helmet? Is that no, Boba wait. Fett? Yeah, and it becomes more than a Rorschach test. It becomes... <laughs> right? You're like, you're looking. So it's, so it gets really exciting to like make this something that's so elegant. And, you know, we were like, oh, we kind of kind of joked, you know, it's like, oh, you know, even the dark side can be beautiful. Um, yes. So it's it's fun. It makes me feel really good that people look at it and go, oh, I'm a big Star Wars fan, but I don't want people to like think I'm a total like crazy because I have a Star Wars like rug. But then I can have this rug and people walk in and they're like, oh, that's a really pretty rug. And don't realize it until they really look close that it's Star Wars. Yes. Yes. Well, I, as we're talking, I, I've pulled up the Ruggable website. And you're talking, you're referring to the dark side Damask charcoal rug. So I'm not a designer. I can certainly talk Star Wars for days and hours. <laughs> but what does Damask mean? Is that just sort of the, the contrast or is that the material or what is that? Damask is a, um, it's one of the older forms of weaving. So it's usually, it's either high contrast or low contrast. And Damask, when woven in fabric, it shows on both sides. Unfortunately, our rugs aren't two-sided, but you get that real t- subtle texture um, of the weave. So it kind of blends in. So you notice in our charcoal, um, darks, our dark side uh, damask, the charcoal, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's that, that frilligree just kind of bleeds in to the woven of the charcoal. Right. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, yeah. so I I picked out a couple of rugs. Uh, one of oh, them, it, one yeah. of them that I got was the Rebellion rug, and it, it's it's <laughs> it. There's no mistaking what we've got going on here. We've got some ties. We've got an A wing, and then we've got this incredibly wonderful, almost life size. Well, one one scale as far as how they compare to the others of the Millennium Falcon itself. What what a beauty that is. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is, um, that was really fun. Uh, We wanted to make sure that we did something that wasn't traditional for rugs. So um, we wanted to do something painterly and bring to life the movement. So actually, I was lucky enough to be the one to design that rug. So it's just like, the strokes and the paint, you know, it's almost like you're, you're painting it and you're trying to figure out how is this going to be woven? How is it going to be, you know, put together? Can I get the scale? Can I get the movement? Can I make sure that it looks good in all the different sizes? Um, Is the proportions right? But for me, um, I happen to be, you know, a little bit of a fan. (laughs) Um, And so I wanted to make sure that we delivered on something that showed movement and that really fans would just be like, okay, I need to have that. Yes. Well, I mean, again, it's, it's an absolute home run. And when I'm looking through these and I'm, you know, very much trying to say, gosh, which one do I want here? Do I, you know, we got one for my son's room. We got one for our, our living room. We got, we got a lot of great ones because as you said, there there are many different sizes that you can get these rugs in. And I'm glad that you mentioned that through the design process, you have to think about how will this look in multiple sizes? Will it look as good, you know, in a smaller one versus versus a large one for a family living room? So talk about some of the challenges for these rugs and how you overcame them. Mm, some of the challenges. So I, in some ways, I feel lucky because... Um, I didn't have a lot of major hurdles for this collection, um, except on a personal level, this was my first collection for Ruggable. Um, so as a designer and as a licensing design manager and leader, I wanted to make sure that that I brought my A-game and I know Star Wars, um, but then I also was learning all of the ruggable nuances and the t- how we get the texture and how we build everything, and, you know, how it's designed and what the thought process is and 
how it's going to go into somebody's home. So some of the hurdles that, that we had were how can we um, incorporate story? And, you know, I've touched on that a couple of times. Um, the team was a fan, so it kind of made it easy. Like Masako is, you know, one of our senior designers, you know, and she's researching and looking at stuff. And, you know, she did the dark side damask. Um, so she looked at a lot of different styles for that. I worked on the rebellion. I wanted something painterly that, you know, wouldn't, isn't a norm. Um, but there was so much for the team to draw from. I mean, you've got four, we, we focused on the empire strikes back. So we had 40 years sure. of art to look at. Um, but I would say one of the biggest challenges was actually making sure we had a balance between the dark side and the rebel side. I can so, see that. Yeah, looking at the design, because you do have a nice balance because there's so much iconography in Star Wars, whether it's the silhouette of Vader or, you know, your the Rogue Squadron dark teal rug that has the silhouettes of the X-Wings or even the, the Geo R2-D2 blue rug. You've got a lot of iconic shapes to draw from and there. There is this wonderful little balance of, of dark and light. Right. It's like the smugglers geo. That's one of my favorites. Um, you know, it's like, that's really, um, parts of the millennium Falcon that we took apart and parts of RTD two when we kind of took it apart and put it back together again. So there was a lot of architectural drawing to try and figure out how to create these iconic shapes because the shapes that you find in Smuggler's Geo, you find throughout Star Wars. Um, and even with the gray, just the, those little pops of red and yellow elevate it to make it, you know, that much more interesting that somebody's going to put in their room. Right. Um, and then, of course, R two D two blue. That's just that's a that's a gimme. You got to do it. Right. Yeah. And he's whether what, did you have certain guidelines from from Lucasfilm licensing that said, hey, we really want to have X, Y, or Z in, incorporated into the rugs? Or were you given pretty much free reign of the franchise? You know, I have to say, Lucas team was amazing to work with. Um, they were really great. They let us take um, some liberties that I didn't think they were going to let us take. The uh, Karelian ECOT is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. You know, ECOT is a, a, a heritage style of rug. And when you look at some of the traditional ECOTs that have been made over the centuries, if you look, you kind of see some of the shapes of the ships. So, oh yeah, you know, in these old ecots. So we're like, okay, how can we? How many ships can we take from Star Wars and incorporate into this beautiful style of rug? So they let us stretch a few things, you know, more than probably. You know, you normally can because you can't stretch Mickey's ears. That's a big no-no. <laughs> right, that makes so, sense. <laughs> but they let, it stretch, they let it stretch the Millennium Falcon out a little bit and play with some of the balance to really get that beautiful integration. I know that uh, Teresa Lucas films, one of her favorites is our is the uh, Carillion Ecot. Well, it's it is slick because it looks like it's uh, almost like a Mediterranean style, if right? It, and then for the color palette, but then you've got it looks like a Thai infiltrator, and you've got X wings, and it's really really amazing how you're able to interweave these together. Yeah, it it was really fun, and it's I mean it's like a puzzle, you know, because you're you're just you're taking shapes and trying to thread everything together. And, you know, of course, a lot of times you start in black and white. This time we actually started in color because we really wanted that traditional heritage ECOT feel. And then we took it to the blacks and the whites, the grays later, which is 
kind of a, a reverse for most designs. Most designs, if you can make them work in black and white, they'll work. Mm-hmm. But we really started in color with this one. We were excited. The the ECOT poly, the polychrome absolutely loved the way it turned out too. Well, the the um, the Tie Fighter Houndstooth blue rug that's one that we snagged as well because it's got. If you didn't know about it, it just looks like this this beautiful streak of this kind of a. Uh, it's I don't even know how to describe, it, but it's basically a, a bunch of Tie Fighters ready to engage. It says in a fierce galactic battle. But I was going to ask you what turned out even better than you dreamed, and, and maybe you've already answered that. Oh, you know what the. The Tie Fighters Houndstooth, we we challenged the designer and we said, okay, how, what can you do with a pattern to make this? So, and she ended up with this great Houndstooth pattern. Um, so it really is; it's a lot of fun. Once again, it shows movement, so you get that mm-hmm. that movement. I would say what turned out better than we dreamed. Yes, and it's really hard. It's, it is hard. They're all they're all. You have a bond with all of them. Yeah, I because I kind of love them all. Is the Star Wars Twall? The Twall is Twall is a is a um, once again um, an old Irish pattern. It's about storytelling, but the designer would watch the movie over and over again, and she would draw each scene, and then she took each of her drawings and piece them together like a puzzle to make sure that they flowed and that there weren't the spacing was just right and that it really told the story and that we captured all of the iconic characters and even the ancillary characters you know i mean there's luke riding the tauntaun when you look close in the twall it's things that you those unexpected like surprises there's you know there's um, the i am your father moment from the empire strikes back right so yeah i think i think the twall i don't know i mean and then you look at star wars the saga um which is a contour line drawing you know it's it's that you put your pencil down and you draw your characters and you never pick up your pencil all the way through. Wow. Um, so that's really cool that you're able to get, I mean, working on Yoda's Yoda's face for us. Cause you know, we have the Mandalorian now and we wanted to make sure that we didn't look like, we didn't make Yoda look like the child. He really needed to look like Yoda. Cause this mm-hmm. was about, the iconic Empire Strikes Back. So how can you get those pencil lines just right? I love yeah. hearing you talk about this because these are things, I look at it, of course, from a Star Wars perspective as both a collector and uh, someone who just, who just likes beautiful things. And you are you have that, but you've also got this design process of making it aesthetically pleasing and Ruggable is really famous for that, but that's not the only thing that Ruggable is known for, is it? Um, well, we're known for our washable rugs. I mean, it's an amazing product when you get right down to it. It's a rug that is completely washable, machine washable, non-slip. You can, you know, um, put it in any room we also have outdoor rugs now. Um, it's got a great clean technology. And so you've got your base for the clean, te- clean technology. And so you can change out and go between your favorite Star Wars or if you happen to, you know, maybe during the holidays need a holiday rug and let Star Wars take a rest. You can. I don't know why you <laughs> would, but you can. We've, we've, had some gr- we've had some great fun headlines like, you know, even Darth Vader's head looks surprisingly good on these themed Star Wars themed washable rugs. We, I feel really lucky to work on a great product that I have, I have two dogs, I have children and to be able, when I discovered these and knew I wanted to work for the company and kind of kept following up, 
the fact that I can wash this rug, you know, once a week if I need to is amazing. So it really, and they feel good. They feel good to the touch. So it's really fun to bring together the Star Wars art, the art of rug making, and take both of those and design something that people are going to enjoy in their home and that are going to make, that's going to make life easier. Well, the first time that you and I spoke, you, you said to me, you know, this is great because if, because they're, these rugs look great and they're washable. When, if I spill my coffee on them, I can just wash it. Well, that's perfect for me, especially when I'm doing the show. And it's not unlikely for me to drink a cup of coffee or some sort of a beverage while we're doing the show. So that, that was just kind of a fun little bonus, I think. Yeah. It, it, like I said, I have dogs and the rug in my office, um, my, I also happen to be lucky enough to have a swimming pool. So they'll swim, go in the garden, and then they come in and lay in my office on the rug. So it goes in the washing machine every couple of weeks. <laughs> Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffee with Kenobi and have a cup of coffee tea or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation to join us in a cwk cafe which is our facebook group and share your star wars thoughts comments reviews and opinions in a family friendly spoiler free place that is also drama free go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation talk about this week's show or just talk about some star wars it is a lot of fun, and you'll make some new friends as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. A big thank you to our CWK Alliance members, Mary Perdue, Terrence King, Smooth Rivera, Cato McNichol, Jim Tallman, J.C. Poe, Ed Kimoto, Greg McLaughlin, Robert Avila, Dustin Mills, Yancey Evans, Chelsea Sansbury, Connie Shee, Tyler Pompa, Hannah, Alex Procasio, Ian Thompson, David Nicely, Simbot Detradarian, Christine Turk, Kurt McKellen, Ross Halibin, Dan Ream, Colby Mead, Alexander Moylan, Frank Mulder, Blake Weaver, Jim Capron, Chris Metz, LJ Souter, Aaron Harris, Chris Gavarka, Jeff Ellis, Daz Davies, Susan Gray, Thea Selby, Christian Dale, Brian McKinney, Jason Hall, Jared Cantor, Eric Struthers, Mark Suter, Angela Sauce, and Dennis Keithley. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, be sure to go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash CWK Alliance and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pour the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show and... 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, live video, and so much more. If you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air, please feel free to reach out to me at Dan Z at coffeewithkenobi.com and I'll share them on the show. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zer, M-R-Z-E-H-R. There are also a lot of ways to connect with me and Coffee with Kenobi on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffee with Kenobi and check us out on Pinterest. You can find me twice a month on the podcast looking at Lucasfilm, part of the Jim Hill Media Podcast Network. And you can find my writing on CWK's website as well as starwars.com where I'm an official blogger there 
as well as on IGN, where I contribute articles on Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. And if you're considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and help you make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out danzymedia.com so we can get the process started. I'm also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. You can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks, as always, to our CWK sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. And don't forget to pre-order my brand new book that I wrote alongside Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton, the Star Wars book published by DK. Be sure to pre-order your copy of the Star Wars book today. I can't wait to share it with each and every one of you. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the Force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word. Go to iTunes and search Coffee with Kenobi and you'll see the show there. My circle of friends has grown so much because of this podcast and each and every one of you, and it means so much to me that we have such a wonderful Star Wars community. Thank you all so much for all you do. I love it. Well, I mean, these these really are wonderful, wonderful products. I can't wait to to get my hands on these and get them in my home. They, they're they beautiful. They definitely speak Star Wars. It's very, very clear to me. Uh, it just, it's fun, I think, for so many of us that when there are Star Wars fans who have a hand in creating these great products. So, so Joni, thank you so much for very much adding a really, really fun aspect of Star Wars into so many of our homes. Thank you very much for for having me on the show and for talking about our rugs. I love Star Wars. I love the rugs. And I love that people are so excited about them. So I appreciate it. And this has been great. It has been great. Please let everybody know where they can find the Ruggable Star Wars collection and and where they can reach out to you if they want to continue the conversation and ask you any questions. They can go to ruggable.com. And we have a great customer service um, group that can handle all kinds of fabulous questions about Star Wars. And we'll take care of everything that we possibly can. I love it. Well, hey, Joni, thank you again so much for being a guest on Coffee with Kenobi. Thank you. A big thank you to Clayton Sandell and Joni Pratt for joining me this week on Coffee with Kenobi. Again, we have done so well on our CWK Alliance trucker hats that we are selling on our website and on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. We already met our goal, but I think we've got room for, I think 50 was the max we did. And the final day to purchase a hat is September 10th. But for now, things seem to be wonderful. So thank you so much to everybody for your support. Don't forget to join me this Monday night at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. This week for Facebook Live, this week we're going to be looking at your top five favorite Star Wars blasters. We've done a lightsaber hilts, and then I thought, well, I guess we could do blasters. There are certainly quite a few designs to choose from. Should be a good time. Have a great week and weekend, everybody. And remember, this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. Discover Thrawn's origins within the Chiss Ascendancy in the first title in an epic new Star Wars trilogy, beginning with Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy. Written by best-selling author Timothy Zahn and read by Mark Thompson, Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy is on sale now wherever audiobooks are sold.